I have some samples here. Do you want to start with the hard stuff first or the easy stuff first? Easy stuff first? Okay. Um, I have two what I think are easy ones. Um, let, let's start with this so I can get it off the bench and then uh, we'll move on to the other easy one. Uh, this is a, a joint we use a lot in the magazine. It's some, some people saw, call it a locking uh, rabbit construction drawer. Some people call it a rabbit and dado. And uh, there are actually two different versions of this as well. Um, just want to double check, I got that milled up. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll pass this around. It's not glued together, so you gotta kinda be gentle with it. But what we're, what we're basically doing is we're gonna put a dado in the side of the drawer at the back and the front, and then the piece that uh, goes into that, we're gonna cut a rabbit. So this is a side, I already have one of these uh, dados cut. We have to cut the dado in the front, then we have to cut rabbits in these, this piece to fit. So this can go together really, really quick. Uh, it's actually a good mass production drawer if you can um, kind of keep all your parts machined accurately. So we'll start with that and um, then I'll show you how to do uh, an integral front and then we'll go from there. So this style drawer has, uh, we won't worry about the bottom yet, uh, this would have a false front on it, meaning you're sizing this drawer to go into an opening. Uh, right now I'm just worried about building a square drawer. We're going to put it in the opening and then later on we're going to slap on a front. It could be an overlay front where it, it covers the whole frame. It could be an inset front where we're fitting it inside the opening. So right now we're just um, trying to get a box that's quasi-square and resembles a drawer together. Um, so, a uh, couple things I've done on this, I've, I've already milled the, the groove in the back and uh, I'll actually talk about what's going on with that later. Now we got to uh, mill the groove in the front. So over at my table saw, I have a quarter inch stack dado set up. So this is just the two outer blades of my stack dado head. And uh, this is usually when I start machining drawers, this is what I like to have. Um, in it constantly. I'm not adding or deleting um, any spacers in there or any extra chippers in there. I, I'm just wanting to run it a quarter inch. So if I need to make something wider than a quarter inch, I have to take more than two cuts. But typically it's just raising or lowering the head or uh, moving the fence just a little bit. So um, let's get started with this. I forgot my drawer side already. Okay, so I want to cut this to a depth of a quarter inch about. And this is something I really like to set up my, um, my saw. It is a Veritas. So often we see, have you ever used a combination square? You know, where it's sixteenths and eighths, thirty seconds and sixty fourths, and the wrong side is always away from you. So you're down here trying to figure it out and you have the 64 scale and you're like, one, two, three, four, five, five. okay, start over, one, two, three. And you, you just can't see what's going on. What's really nice about this one is the outer, uh, well, I should have it this way. This is all 16 this is all 30 seconds. When I turn it over, this is all 30 seconds, this is all 16 So it transfers from one side to another. If I wanna be super accurate, I can put 30 seconds here. If I'm uh, comfortable with, um, you know, like here I'm trying to hit a quarter inch, I can put my 16th uh, side up and I can hit that. Uh, what I'm gonna do, I usually measure off the side of the, the left side of the blade. My left side, your right. So I'm gonna look for um, a sharp point, put this down next to it, and just set the tooth height off my square. And what I'm doing here is I'm just moving this back and forth to find the high point of the blade. Different saws have different spots with, within the throat plate where your high point is going to be. Some saws your high point is actually uh, in the back third, some it's right in the middle. Uh, rarely do I find it it's in the front half, but this needs to go up just a little bit 
and I'm happy with that. So I'm going to lock that in place. Uh, next thing I have to do, so I, I'm going to cut a, a dado in here, which is just a groove across the board, a uh, quarter inch deep. And now I need to set my uh, location for where I'm going to cut it right here. To set that location, I'm going to use the, uh, uh, this is actually the front. So there's my sharp tooth again. I'm going to move this over. Actually, I'll do this where you can see it a little better. And I'm going to bring this right up almost. OK, so there that goes. Uh, so what I've done is. I've set the groove back the thickness of the drawer face, or the drawer front. I've set the groove quarter of an inch high. All I have to do now is make sure I don't have anything in between my fence and my workpiece. Move this over. Uh, I don't think I'm forgetting anything. I'm going to turn this on. This makes a little bit of noise, but it keeps the dust down. Oh, pretty good. I'm not dead on, but pretty good. I will show you. Um, when you're doing this at home, don't be like John. Actually test it on a piece of scrap. Um, I have uh, just this is a cut off of this stuff. So it's always uh, nice to have, OK, before I commit myself to this cut, try it on a piece of scrap. Make sure it fits before you machine everything. So uh, for this, let's say on this drawer, we don't have this weird thing going on on the bottom. We're just starting out. What I'm going to do is cut these dados, cut these dados, do it on all the drawers. And then uh, depending on the style of drawer, if your backs go all the way to the back, all you'd have to do is flip this around and cut those dados as well. On this style, I want a little bit of an anti-tip, so I moved them up. So at this point, I would have to move this over, cut these as well, and then I can move on to uh, the drawer fronts. So uh, my fronts are actually a little bit more than a half an inch. They're, they're just a little bit thicker than that. So I know my blade height is at a quarter of an inch. I pretty much don't have to worry about going over right now. So I can set this up to cut a rabbit. So to cut the rabbit, I'm going to put in a sacrificial fence, or sometimes I'll call it a zero clearance um, fence, something. So um, does anyone at home have saw marks on the side of your fence? Never happens, does it? Um, so this will keep that off it. And uh, uh, what I use to, to hold this on, you could just grab a board and hold it on with a, a couple clamps. I really like these guys. All you have to do is drill a couple of holes in the top of your, your sacrificial fence, and this drops in, and you have a nice, clean uh, surface that, with no obstructions that, that you can, can, can kind of cut all day. OK, so I'm going to move this over to just the edge of the teeth. OK. And then I'm actually going to use my, uh, my practice board here just to dial it in before I start going crazy. Mm -hmm. 
so I know this isn't going to go in. It's going to be a little bit tight. And at this point, too, first of all, let's double check the depth. Okay. All I have to do is raise the blade just a little bit. Okay. Turn this off to just explain. So initially the reason I didn't use a, a scrap piece was I, you know, in my mind I really can't screw it up too bad. It's when you have to start finding a piece to actually made into that that you get into problems. Uh, one thing I noticed, and we should talk about st stock prep, if I put this on here, from the time I milled it up, I think Thursday to now, this thing has moved a little bit. So when I was running that, um, I didn't notice it. I had this side down, so it's not tipping on me. Then when I go to put it in my dado, this goes in, this goes in, the center doesn't go in. So that's why I stopped, got out my push pad, and put pressure down right on that high spot. It's thin enough that I can force it down move it across, and then when I put this in, the joint's going to pull that board straight. Um, usually, I'm just using finger pressure over here just to kind of hold it down. Uh, if you want to use this, it's a, a great thing to have as well. At this point, in theory, you wouldn't really even need the miter gauge. You could just use push pads as long as this is long enough not to start moving around on your fence. So I'm going to do that quick. <coughs> this will be the front, this will be the back, so I'll machine all this at, at once. If you're doing this at home, machine all these grooves on the sides first, then worry about the fronts and the backs, and that's kind of the, the order of operations for mass production too. Sorry, I'm going to make you work today. <laughs> okay, let's see if these actually go together. Yay. Let's go in. Yay. Sweet. What I've left out on these are the grooves in the bottom. And I, I typically do that last um, just because um, as you mill this up, certain things can happen. You can have a little bit of tear out. Um, you can uh, forget what goes where and just start cutting uh, things in random places. On these boards, you're really not going to get wrong where the rabbit goes. It goes on the ends. So that's pretty, 
pretty self-explanatory. With these dados, it, it really doesn't even matter where you're putting them, whether it's uh, tight to the front or there's a little offset in the back, you're probably not gonna get them wrong. At the very, very end, I cut the grooves in because uh, this is a good example that I did yesterday. I uh, cut one drawer right, or, in, uh, or one drawer side right and one drawer side wrong. So on this guy, we're perfectly fine there. Our groove lines up. But is it this side? Oh, actually, I'll replace the front. So this side, you're fine. Let's see if we, OK, see how the groove is fine there? Then you get to this side, that's not so good. <laughs> uh, so that's typically why I wait to, to do the grooves at the, at the very you know, last. Sometimes I'll even, um, you know, rough assemble the drawer and just get it together like this and then go, okay, I need to cut grooves in the bottoms of all of these. So this side goes against the fence. This side goes against the fence. So as I'm standing, this will be on the fence side. And this side will go against the fence. So one at a time, or if you're just running a, a small batch, you can kind of rough assemble them, set them out, and go, okay, don't do this. We're, we're going to keep all our parts straight. If you're mass producing them, where you're just sending them, sending them, sending them in, in batches, uh, about the best way is to have stacks where you'd have all your material stacked up, and you want to keep it in that orientation where you pick it up and go, okay, I don't want to start turning around and, and doing this on the wrong edge. I take this, and this is going to run against that uh, without turning it around. So um, let's run the grooves on these quick, and then uh, put this together. And uh, I want to show you another style of front as well. Yes. Um, and I'll get to that. Um, I did that just as a, I don't want to call it fun, it, it has purpose, but I just want to do something a little bit different on one of these drawers, um, just to show something out of the ordinary. Uh, okay, so that is set up for uh, a half inch, and that's what I want. I have to stop and think. see which is the well this is probably the less ugly of the two okay let's see if this actually goes together oh this is front so this will go just like this Yay. Um, I don't think I, I must have moved those to somewhere else. Oh, my stack of bottoms are under here.
And the quarter inch dimension works on this because I'm on these particular drawers, I'm using Baltic birch on for the bottoms, which is usually almost dead on a quarter of an inch. Um, because people are watching, it doesn't want to go in. I won't force it, but. So on this one, the bottom slides in from the back. Just like that. Might have to do just a little bit of sanding on that plywood to get it to go in smoothly. Um, if you have undersized plywood, then the bottom becomes more problematic. You're probably going to have to do two cuts with a, a regular saw blade rather than a dado set just to get that to go together. Also, you might notice the top of my drawers, uh, we have some issues with some height discrepancies, and it doesn't look good at all. These are actually cut way higher than I need them to be. Uh, the, these sides are uh, well over eight inches tall, and I only need a, a seven inch drawer. Uh, part of the, my rationale is I did this on purpose. I, I have these rough edges that if I didn't have this on the bottom to tell me uh, what's going on, I know when I get over to the saw that this rough edge against a fence, something's wrong. Uh, this means don't cut grooves up here, cut grooves down here. So it's just my little way. On this one, I have a squiggle. On this one, it, it's, I have a defect there that's going to get cut off later. I don't put the whole drawer together and then start cutting around the outside. Typically before I, I uh, do my final assembly, I'll go over to the table saw, rip this down to the size I think I need, and then go from there. Now, as far as uh, fitting this, figuring out how big of a drawer we, we need to have, uh, typically we try to build the case first and then we measure the opening that it's going to go in. Uh, for width, I usually subtract an eighth of an inch from the sides. So you'd have a sixteenth to each side, and this is a, a drawer that just, it's a wooden drawer that goes in a wooden opening. And then I subtract a sixteenth uh, to an eighth of an inch for the total height as well. And um, when you're thinking about those measurements, it, it's, it's always nice to have it tight until it gets humid and your drawers don't work anymore. So um, when you're selecting stock for the sides, uh, part of that, the thought process is what you're, what you're kind of dealing with. So I have my little uh, drawing here. Uh, typically when I'm looking at stock, the, even if I'm picking it out uh, like at the yard, I'm looking at the, the end grain. The, it's always funny, the forklift operators think you're crazy because they just look at a board for overall length, overall width, and does it have any defects on the face? And I'm down on the end looking, okay, what is this thing actually? So by looking at the end grain, you can pretty much extrapolate what the face grain is going to look like, but you can also pick out uh, how big was the tree? How fast did the tree grow? Um, is this uh, a tree maybe that grew at an angle because on one side it has tight grain, on the other side it has uh, really open grain. So this is my um, very skillful drawing of uh, j just a, a regular old flat sawn board where you get those nice uh, curved uh, grain lines. It's, uh, so the center of the tree would be here, the outside of the tree would be here. With this board, it changes the most in its width. So it would change mostly in this dimension, very little in this dimension. That's why in the winter, uh, solid oak floors open up cracks because they shrink. Uh, this would be a rift sawn board. Uh, typically, rift sawn boards are, have grain at a, about a 45 degree angle all the way up to 60 or more sometimes. Uh, sometimes you'll actually get lucky. The stuff that they sell as rift sawn are darn near quarter sawn, so you can get a little price break there. And then here we have quarter sawn, uh, where the grain goes almost straight up and down. And on a quarter sawn board, it changes very little in width. But then in thickness, that's where it makes the movement. Because if you think about it, a quarter sawn board is really a flat sawn board cut or tip 90 degrees. So if you have a quarter sawn floor, it doesn't open up in the winter. But what happens is your furniture moves up and down throughout the year. Um, which can be hard on, um, as, uh, like, base molding. Oh, I lost my... 
I don't even know what this thing is, but it's attached to me. So when I'm thinking about drawers, all of this gets turned on its side. If I have a flat sawn board, it's going to move most up and down. So that tells me seasonal changes, changes in humidity. It's probably not going to get caught on the sides. If anything, it's going to swell up and be too tall. Or in the winter, it's going to swell down and maybe get too short. If I use this guy, it's going to do the opposite. It's almost never going to swell up and down, but it might swell to the side and, and get stuck there. So th that's something I just think about uh, as I'm uh, putting this together is, okay, what time of year it is? Where is this thing going? What's the moisture content of my wood? And then what is, probably, what is it probably going to do in its life cycle? Uh, this guy, the, the rifts on is kind of nice because it moves a little bit this way and a little bit this way, but it doesn't go one way uh, usually more than another. A lot of times it depends on the cut, how close it is to quarter sawn or how close on the other spectrum it is uh, to flat sawn. So th that's kind of the, the first thing I'm looking at when I um, have a batch of wood that I need to mill up into drawer parts. Now as far as wood goes, I'm, I'm not too picky on what I make drawers out of. But the joke here is everything's a photo prop anyway. It's not real furniture. So uh, the, uh, we, you know, I'll, I'll make some, some stuff out of, out of pretty goofy stuff. The stock I'm using today is actually basswood and poplar. Um, I, I shouldn't say poplar. It's, we call it popple. What it is is it's a type of aspen. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not very strong stuff. It's not very heavy stuff, so it's good to keep the, the weight light. Uh, it's, it's pretty dimensionally stable. And uh, it, uh, it, it, it's going to be um, pretty well behaved because it's been kiln dried. It's been acclimated to the shop. It's not going to move around uh, too much on me. Um, and and I'm a, I'll use almost anything. People think I'm crazy, but I'll use uh, quarter sawn oak for the sides of drawers. Makes a very strong drawer. Makes a very heavy drawer, but it's it's also very stable. Um, the the classic that you see everybody use everywhere is poplar, and nothing wrong with poplar. I think the big reason they use poplar is because relatively stable and it grows on trees. It's pretty cheap. Um, you'll see pine. In cabinetry anymore, you see a lot of uh, soft maple go into to drawer parts. So uh, I didn't, I'd just say if, if w anything that grows on a tree is legal, it's just what pains do you want to go through uh, to do it. I probably wouldn't make drawer parts out of ebony or cocobolo or, um, you know, things like that. We'll save that for the outside. But... Um, <laughs> You know, stuff like that. That Oh, that makes good drawer sides right there. Tell Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, now going from that, I have a, a drawer. I have, I have to do eight of these drawers. They're seven inches tall. And um, they're deep so they're, they can hold some weight. I need a nice strong drawer that uh, isn't going to fall apart and isn't going to wear out either. I know that the material in this is rather soft. The case that this goes in is going to be cherry. So uh, after a few years, I'm probably going to start seeing little white sawdust fall out of my, my uh, piece because uh, I have all that weight and it's actually wearing the wood away. So that's why I put these wear strips on the bottom. On this particular one, I um, used white oak because I have white oak. And uh, another good alternative would be to use um, like hard maple. That'd be, uh, you know, something hard that slides easy. I've gone a little extra uh, here where uh, I'm sure you've seen on the drawer I, I passed around. It sticks out the side. It's tongue and grooved into the drawer side. You could just glue on an eighth-inch wear strip on the bottom if you really wanted to. Another strategy is just make it out of whatever you want. And have you ever seen the, um, the, the drawer glide tape at all? Uh, I think we have some of that here, actually. Maybe. There it is. Oop. Sorry, Lucas. 
I just killed your TV. I do that twice a day. Um, please don't ask me where I get this. I get this from that drawer. Um, <laughs> that's, and, and now the rest of the staff knows that it's kept in that drawer, so it'll be gone. Okay, so it isn't blue, it's actually clear. The blue is the backing. So this is that, this is that glide tape that you can, usually I put on the case, so pass that around. And, um, and, and it's, you know, you're like, oh, it's a strip of, you know, it's basically overgrown scotch tape. It works wonderfully. Um, with a lot of use, it does wear out, but you just put another strip down, and as long as you have a drawer with it in it, you're fine. So, how's that going? Um, I'll, I'll just show you quick how in the world I put this bottom on. Um, part of the reason I did this was just for me. Um, no one will ever really know it's there. On this particular piece, there's going to be a false front on. So all of this stuff gets covered by a solid drawer front. The only time you'd ever see this is if you pull the drawer out, look at the bottom, and go, what in the world is going on? So uh, uh, someone once said, I, I don't even know who it was, what I build is for other people, but how I go about it, that's for me. So this is just one of my little things that, that I like to do once in a while is just something that no one is ever, ever going to see. And the big reason I, I did this, too, is it, it gives me a, a great way to actually lock everything together while I glue it up. So pulled apart. This isn't together yet, but I'll pass this around. So th the runner has just a groove in it. Pretty easy to do. You could just run that at the table saw really quick. This has a groove to fit it. So what you'd have to do is uh, cut the groove and then cut this tongue to fit in the groove so that the inside edge is flush and on mine, the outside sticks out. You could just run this so it's flush on both sides as well, but you can um, pull that apart and look at it and know that it's not a parlor trick. Uh, I, I cut it down. Actually, let's start with that. If I can find my board back. It's right in front of me. So this is actually what I start out with for the base. And that's a good point. If I'm trying to run that at the saw, I don't want to have that little strip and try to be running it over the blade because then for us, we're really testing the effectiveness of the saw stop. It's you just flat out know something's going to go wrong. So on this, I use a wider board as a handle. And uh, for this, I, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I actually have a hand plane to do this. This is a, a Stanley tool. This one is uh, not new by any means. This, is, this probably came out, uh, this particular model was a post-World War II plane. But uh, let's see if I can turn this. On this side, it has a little eighth inch blade. And I'll turn it right. Uh, so to your right, there's an eighth inch blade. So that's going to cut that groove. Then on the other side, it has a blade with a notch in the middle that so happens to be an eighth of an inch wide. And that is going to cut the tongue. So you can still get these. They just. Uh, reside on eBay or in antique stores. Uh, but there are companies that if you want to do this by hand, uh, they still make tongue and groove planes today. Or, like I said, you could do this just on the table saw. You could get your router table out and do this. Uh, you could do it a myriad of ways. So all I'm doing is uh, pushing it. And every time the plane moves across, it takes a shaving. And when it stops cutting, uh, I know I'm done.
Maybe a little more. Yep, not cutting anymore. So the next step is I'm just going to rip off the bottom. I'll do that at the bandsaw. Come here. Okay, oh, might as well leave these up here. Now we have to cut the tongue. What's that? Um, this is a tongue and groove plane. This particular one is a Stanley 146. Um, and the good news is it's the most rare of the entire line, so you're welcome. Uh, they made a 147 and a 148. This uh, actually, if, well, if I can hold it up, it, um, it cuts a centered tongue and groove joint on 3 8 inch thick stock. The 147 would be 5 eighths inch stock, and the most common of them is the 148, and that cuts on 7 eighths stock. And then they had a, a, a different style. It looks different than this, than the, the flip around push pull. Uh, they had a 48 and a 49 that did 3 quarter and a half inch stock as well. And then you have all the other companies uh, <laughs> making similar things as well. But uh, Lee Nielsen still makes tongue and groove planes. Uh, you can get a tongue and groove plane attachment for uh, Veritas Lee Valley uh, plow plane. So this stuff is still around. It's just a neat little way to, to do stuff quickly without having to set up machines. And so that would lock on there right now. Uh, now, I should explain this too. I've already run the groove in the back. So on this particular uh, setup, I know that my uh, bottom is going to slide in from the back. I don't need this groove to go all the way down, so I stopped it. One little thing that I hate that no one ever sees is when you do a side like this, this would be for the front, this would be for the back, and then you have a groove in the bottom. So you have this, this random piece of wood back here that's not doing anything because your dado uh, went right through. So when you look on the bottom of the drawer, you have this just random joint mark. On the bottom of this drawer, you don't have the random joint mark. So I'm, I'm sorry, things that no one ever sees bothers me. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I'm putting this corner together. And you know, it's a little bit of work, but the nice thing is when I glue it together, it's not moving around, it's locked in there. And I've added a little bit more glue surface area so it can't go anywhere. Um, makes the joint a little bit stronger. And uh, going back to wood selection, I know with these, uh, s this set of drawers, this wood, it's not gonna be the strongest drawer in the world. It's not gonna be heavy. And uh, the wood is pretty stable, but I have everything in these drawers from quarter sawn grain to uh, flat sawn grain, a little bit of riff sawn, and maybe that's all in one board. So I don't want to take the chance of this thing swelling up vertically. I don't want to take the chance of it swelling up side to side. So uh, this little runner keeps all of this away from 
everything in the case. I can run this almost tight to the case, and if I have to make any adjustments, all I have to do is shave off a little bit of this. I don't have to touch the side at all. Uh, typically, if I, if I am in a situation where the drawer swelled up or the case moved and I, I can actually get it back out of the case, um, I'll actually taper it from front to back a little bit, either by planing or sanding aggressively. So maybe I'll take a sixteenth off the back and feather that out to zero on the front so the front stays pretty tight, but then it's almost wedge-shaped. So as you push it in, it doesn't uh, jam in the opening tighter and tighter and tighter. Same with any adjustments up and down. I'll leave the top as tight as I can, and then if I have to, I'll, I'll cut the back down. Um, at an angle so you can actually get it in there. I, whatever I happen to have at that moment. Um, <laughs> if I'm in the kitchen, maybe I just have a kitchen knife, so I'm just kind of whacking at it. And I'm making fun of my wife now. Um, who should know that screwdrivers exist but continues to use flatware. But no one ever does that, right? <laughs> um, I'll, the other thing I want to show you, on this style drawer, this is just a false front. Worry about making the box, worry about building as, as well as you can. We're going to put a false front on it. So what I typically do for when it comes time to install uh, false fronts is I get double-sided tape. And this is the double-sided tape that we have. It's wonderful. It resides in a drawer over there. And... Uh, You actually have to guard this because the editors will come out and try to steal this. I don't know what they're doing, but um, I had someone say yesterday that there's a, a pretty good uh, double-sided tape at Ace Hardware that is almost like a mesh. Um, this we're lucky; we have a woodsmith store in town, so it uh, they store double-sided or they stock double-sided tape this is from IPG which is the inner tape polymer group it sounds like a front for the mob but um, it exists um, th this stuff is really nice it's not like the thin scotch tape where uh, unless you're touching exactly on it it'll, it'll grab it's thick enough that there's a little bit of a cushion so what I would do on a on a drawer like this um, Depending on how much tape I have left at the time, <laughs> I could run a, a strip side to side. Sometimes I'll run a strip up and down like this. So I have a strip over here. I try not to do that where I, I have um, spots without tape. So let's do like that and pretend we're, we're putting that together. Uh, get this thing in the opening, and then uh, let's say I want to do an inset drawer, which are the hardest to do. Uh, on an inset drawer, I would very carefully size the drawer to the opening, and at that point, it doesn't matter really what it is. If it's not a perfect rectangle, that's fine. If it's a parallelogram, cut it to fit that opening, and uh, just get a nice even reveal around the outside. Uh, a lot of our photos you'll see us using pennies as spacers because we figure people can afford those. And uh, you can use shims, you can um, use, uh, you know, playing cards, however many playing cards you want, left to right, uh, top to bottom. And then just push that drawer, that false front, against the drawer after you peel the backing off and it should stick on there. Uh, give it some good pressure and then very carefully uh, pull the whole unit out. Typically, on a big drawer, we'll actually screw through this into the false front, so we'll screw them from the back into that. On a smaller drawer, you could probably get away with just drilling whatever holes you want for um, hardware and attach it that way. And that's how these guys were done. So, uh, I don't know if you, sorry. Um, so this is our sharpening station. This ran maybe in last month's issue. And this is a false front. So what I've done is I've, I've just spaced that so uh, I have a nice even reveal all the way around. But when I pull out the drawer, you might notice it's not even left to right. This side sticks out more than that side. And it, that's just to cover up uh, how the interior of this drawer worked. So this drawer is actually screwed three times from the back. The double-sided tape is still in there. 
it's not going to go anywhere, so I, I figure that's not going to hurt. And on this particular one, um, the, uh, the hardware doesn't run all the way through front to back because that's the size of screw I had. Uh, <laughs> if you want to go through all the way, a lot of times you have to buy a longer screw because um, they know you have to buy a longer screw and they make you buy a longer screw. Uh, it's a way to generate more revenue, I guess. Sometimes you get lucky and, and you get something long enough. For, you can also counter board to, to try to make it work. So I, I do want to pass this around. This is another secret um, weapon I have in here. It's, you've seen this before, right? It's not the push pad. It's what's on the push pad. Have you ever seen uh, the little bench cookies or bench pucks that these companies have? You get them, and, and it's like, what is this stuff? It, it actually sticks. Usually when a company gives you a free push pad with a machine, you know the, the pad on there that doesn't do anything? It's, it, it has the consistency of this floor where you're pushing a board and the pad keeps going and you're like, oh, the board's still back there. Well, that was fun. Um, we found this material at, at Lee Valley. They sell it in big sheets. And it's, it's an uh, adhesive-backed foam pad, and it really, really works well on push pads. So you can do stupid things and get away with it. Uh, might have noticed when I was cutting the groove, I had my double push pads on there. With something that I wasn't comfortable that the pad is actually going to grip the wood, if I don't have a positive stop behind the board I, or a hook, I can't be 100% sure that I, the board's going to go through as I push it. So this allowed me to do that, put pressure down on the board so I get a nice even groove on the side. And part of the reason I wanted to show you that is because uh, the next cut we have to make is kind of stupid. So... I, I warned you going into it. Yes, sir. Did you make doors out of plywood? Sure, do all the time. Uh, it's just, you know, sh uh, obviously a drawer for the shop works perfectly. Um, if I try to make plywood drawers for my wife, she would probably beat me in my sleep. But. Um, I, I love making drawers out of Baltic birch plywood. It, it just looks nice. It, it has a nice modern look, a cool look. Um, the only th problem I get into plywood, and I, I run into it sometimes here, is... Uh, yeah, it's we So th the first thing you know that's going to break off is this little piece right here, and sometimes this will break off. I actually made one of these sides a little bit tight. Uh, it would have been this one. So this should have that dado on the front, but now it got donated to the drawer front. And that's, when I was in there, it was fine. When I tried to take it apart, it must have swelled overnight. Oh, now it shrank. So, um, so this is, is now with that. So that, that would be my only kind of my warning with plywood, especially around the edges, is just to make sure the stuff doesn't delaminate on you. And you wouldn't necessarily have to do this lock rabbit anyway. You could, um, well, you could domino it or biscuit it or even pocket hole screw it with butt joints, and it would work great too. So um, let's, what I want to do uh, is actually do an integral front, which is this thingy-majiggy. Let's see if I get out of the way. I'm not helping. There it is. So think of this like uh, this half inch drawer front is right here. You have um, the, your little tongue that goes into your dado. Uh, you have a rabbit back here. But on this, we already have the front on there. And uh, this isn't as fun to machine. But when you get done, you have an integral drawer front where you don't have to attach anything, it just, it's on there, it goes right in. So to do this, the first thing we have to do is we have to cut this uh, groove in there. And you could do it a couple ways. You could do it at a router table, uh, either vertically like this with a, I'd do it with an upcut spiral bit, or if you have one of those three wings, ring slot cutters, you could do it at the router table like that. Um, I'm going to do it at the table saw just to show you uh, how to do that if you want to try it. I must have put those boards right here. Okay, so this will be the side on this. The first thing I need to do on this cut is I need to make a, a groove the same depth as my drawer side. 
So my drawer side is going to drop in and I'm going to use my side to set my blade height. Okay. Uh, next, I need to set my fence. Actually, we're going to get rid of this because I don't want that to get in the way. And move this stuff off. And I'm going to set this spacing for a quarter of an inch. Uh, so typically on a, a Biesermeyer fence, everything locks to the front. If I have to make any small changes, I'm not going to try to tap it up here because that's not where it connects. I'm going to make little changes up here at the front, move it with my thumb. Sometimes I come over and actually grab the, the, the wing and make that adjustment. Or sometimes I'm just bumping the handle on the, the fence as well. Uh, this is about a half an inch. Yeah. Oh, but our planer does not like to make half inch. It likes to make uh, about a 64th over a half an inch. So that's why I set it like this. If I was really dead on, I know I could come in and go half inch tall. Uh, if I'm measuring to the inside tooth, quarter inch, or if I'm measuring to the outside tooth, half inch. Uh, so, obviously, if this was thicker or thinner, you'd have to double check that. I, if I can at all, I, I try to make my measurements off my stock. Uh, a good example would be if I need to subtract the width of um, what the, the drawer sides will be. Instead of saying, oh, it's a half an inch and a half an inch, I'm sure it's, it's just a, a full inch. I'll stack them together make that measurement and go, oh, it's actually a hair over an inch. And if I had to make that set up here, I might use both to do that. It's just a way to decrease uh, error and <laughs> try to get a little bit accurate. So now I have to run this over, over this. And I talked to my boss, Kevin, about this. I said, how do you do this? And he said, I'll do it. I do it the exact same way you do it. Uh, you get a push pad, you grab the board and push it across. Now, uh, if we try to put this in the magazines, uh, I'm sure Dave would have a coronary. Yeah, yeah, safety of the police would come out. So the first thing people would say, well, well, let's get a high fence on there. Let's get this high fence on here. If I push this across like this, I have a place to actually grab the board in the strongest method I know, assuming you have thumbs. And I, I shouldn't laugh at that because I cut myself yesterday. But this is the, the strongest way I can hold this. If I go to this high fence, all I have is this, where if it starts ejecting, uh, if it goes like this, if it goes like this, I, I can't do anything but push towards the fence and, and try to hold on to it. So I can actually hold on to it like this. If you're not comfortable doing this, uh, or let's say your uh, saw doesn't have a fence that's exa exactly square to the table, or it's a low fence where you don't feel like you have enough uh, meat to keep this thing from moving back and forth, a good way to go about it is to build a little saddle jig where a uh, saddle jig would simply be a, a, a vertical board similar to this and then you'd run a board across the top and a board across here and then your saddle fence would ride along your, your rip fence. But um, for this, we just do it this way as long as you have a, a sharp blade in it in your saw, um, we haven't run into problems, so here goes. You want to stand there? <laughs> no, we'll be fine.
so there's that guy. One thing, John. The other thing that makes that a better cut is he has a nice wide piece that he's working with. So you've got, if you were to do that with like a base grain piece, yeah, that's true. it would just be too narrow and too shitty. But because he's got three or four inches of width there, that's pretty, pretty square and solid. See why Dave comes? See why I have <laughs> uh, and, and then the other two things that, that really make this safe, safer, I have a zero clearance insert. When this goes through, it's not going to fall down into the saw. And then my other little secret weapon, I have a push pad that actually pushes, not slips on me. So we have that. So for this particular... Uh, style of, of drawer front. We now have this groove cut all the way in and we have to remove a little bit of material so that the drawer has somewhere to go. So on this I have to actually uh, cut away about a quarter of an inch and I better double check to make sure what side is front and what side is back. So this will be my front. I'll actually write on it front genius. And uh, now to do this, I could set up, um, I could take out my dado set, put in a regular saw blade, and just make that cut. But what realistically is going to happen is all you're going to do is create a little projectile that comes shooting out at you anyway. So I'm not going to change my setup. I'm just going to put my uh, sacrificial fence back in and then machine off the whole thing basically turn that off cut into sawdust and not have to deal with little projectiles. So for this guy again, run the fence right up to the edge of the teeth because I want to go in about a quarter inch. Right now this is uh, set a little bit high so you want to make sure to lower this just a little bit so you don't plow through your drawer front. Uh, I've already messed up because I have the wrong side up. So we'll go like that. So on this, I could push this through with my blocks. I'm going to uh, get a little bit more support if I use my miter gauge. If I want a little bit more support. So that is that guy. Uh, the only different thing about this, on the first drawer we did, we could start with all the sides, machine all the sides, and then uh, get that rabbit to fit in there. On this one, you have to just about do the front first and uh, then do the sides. One negative thing I find about this style drawer is that um, the back of it, I really don't want to go through all this work to make the back of it look like this. I'd want to do the back like I did before where it's just a rabbit. So I have a yet, yet another setup. It's just, it's a, a cool way to do it, but it's about two extra setups and you're dealing with one oddball thickness that is different than the rest. Uh, but if you want that integral, that's, that's the way to do it on that guy. Again, you notice I haven't run the grooves yet. I would make the side and the back to fit in it, get the drawer together, and then run the grooves at the last minute so you don't end up like this stack of what should be a drawer but isn't. Um, have we talked about anything you wanted to know about so far? I have to check my list. We talked a little bit about fitting it. Are you happy with that? Or I don't see too many blank stairs, but. That's the toughest way to fit a drawer, though. Or this guy? Yeah. Well, you get a hammer and. Regular sides fit on the side of the drawer? Yes, this, um, this style side. Would, would fit on this. I'd, yes, that never happens. That, well, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so that style side would, would fit on that front. Now one thing you'll notice, this, this is actually a, a little trick I do too. Uh, this side I know is just a little bit more than a half an inch and you know it's not seated all the way down anyway. But do you see how that side sticks up just a little bit? That's another trick I'll use for fitting because uh, what people see on the outside is the reveal. That's, that's just the line that they see, how it fits in the opening. When it's in the drawer, you can't really see what's going on. So by having this stick out a little bit, I can go back through and fine tune this side. I can either plane it or sand it down and uh, kind of fine tune it for the opening. Sometimes that means I would have to remove more material at the back than the front. Uh, sometimes I'm just trying to flush it up and uh, Sometimes I'm leaving it alone because I made everything too small, but um, we got that drill. Uh, let's do, we talked a little bit about that. We'll do that. Time of morning is it? Better hurry up. Okay. Um, one thing I just want to talk to you a little bit about is um, how to speed things up a little bit. And one, one way to do that is maybe to uh, use some construction that a lot of people don't think is really classic, but uh, is just as strong to tell you the truth. Um, I see more and more like kitchen cabinet drawers where their pocket holes screwed together. And at first you go, well, that's pretty shady craftsmanship. Um, but then you start thinking about, like, what, uh, what do you actually see on these drawers? Because if you just did a butt-jointed drawer, glued this together, and run pocket screws down it, you can't really mess it up. So it's going to be a nice, strong drawer. And on this, let's say this is a little bit bigger, and we're going to cover this with a false front. You never see them anyway. It's like, well, you guys aren't lazy. You're actually pretty smart. Uh, another way to do it that I love to do on drawers is I, I like to actually use a domino on it. And I, I talk about that uh, in several classes. Uh, this is, we'll pass these around. You have to give these a ba back. These are like... This is like 15 cents I'm handing you. Uh, this is a domino. It's, it's a piece of wood. Um, so what we're doing is we're cutting a, a floating uh, tenon. Or a, we're cutting a mortise for a floating tenon. And that's going to go in there. I use dominoes and biscuits kind of interchangeably depending on what project th that I'm doing. So I could go right down the side of this with biscuits. So if I want to hook this together, I could do biscuits right down the side. Uh, it'd be pretty strong. It, it'd align it really, really well for the glue up so things aren't moving around. On this one, I actually used um, dominoes. There, we got that apart. So on this board, I have uh, those dominoes already installed. This one is um, what that goes into. And then you see, see my one mistake? It happens. That's why I have this. So I, my first class yesterday, I was going along and actually had this, and I was dominoing. I forgot to set my depth setting, so I ran the domino in, or the cutter into the end of my finger. And... It didn't feel good either. So um, I just want to show you how quick you can go about doing this. So for this particular drawer, this will be my front. I need my sides to go all the way up. So if I, if I put it together like this, when I put my false front on, you'd see front, the secondary front, and then the side. I want to run the side all the way up to my false front to hide that. And all I have to do is mark out where I want these things to go. So for this, I'm going to clamp this board in my vise, like this.
There we go. And then it's a matter of marking out my center points for where I want this thing to go. So we're going to put one here, and we're going to put one here. On this side, I'm, I'm keeping them off the bottom because that's where my groove is going to go. You can measure this out if you want to be uh, fair to everything. Um, it looks like I have a few more here and a little wider spacing there. It's okay. And typically what I'll do is uh, these come in different sizes. So this is a size I passed around to you, but this is the smallest smaller size that I'm going to use for this one. A lot of times on these joints, the more of these that you pack in along the width, the stronger the joint's going to be. Uh, Fine Woodworking did an article on tenon strength, I don't know how many years ago, and <laughs> the domino didn't look very good in it because pretty much they did, it, it wasn't a joint this wide by any means, but they put like two dominoes that far apart in it, and went, oh, it came right apart. And the, the strength for this, if you want the strongest joint possible when you're doing this, whether you're doing a domino or you could also do th this with a spline, just run a, a dado down in there, is just to pack as many of these things in as possible. So if I really packed them in, what am I going to get? Two, four, six. I could get 10 across this width with this size. But, you know, at 15 cents a piece, you know, six is good enough for who it's for. So on this particular one, this is about the spacing uh, we're going to get. So it's uh, probably more than enough. With this material, too, these are stronger than the wood around it. Uh, these are out of beach, and this is box elder. So um, that's not going to be a problem. So for the actual machine, it looks a lot like a biscuit joiner. And instead of the little circular saw blade to cut out pockets for the biscuit footballs, it has what, what basically is a, it's a upcut spiral router bit. And you can get different sizes to put in this. This is the six millimeter. For the ones I'm using, I need to go down to the five millimeter. Lock this in place. Let's see. Plug it in. Get dust collection. All right. Ready? So it spins, just like a drill bit or a router bit, but then this is wobbling back and forth. And I have three settings on the top. So right now this setting is, it would be a tight mortise side to side. So it would be like these guys where they just go in tight. I can open it up a little bit or I can make it really, really wide. And, and that's what that's doing. So I, I like to show this because this technology is not going away. Uh, some people just flat out don't like Festool. Uh, I'll agree it's, it is not cheap. Um, but uh, what I've seen with uh, biscuit joiners throughout the years, no one's putting more money or development into biscuit joiners. What they're trying, uh, the actual the opposite is happening. You're, you're seeing them rush to the low end of the market where how can we economize these and compete against everyone else that's selling them for almost nothing. And when the, when the patent runs out on this, everyone's going to have one. Um, did you notice a few years ago the multi-tool, all of a sudden everyone ha has one? What do you think happened? Patent ran out for, uh, uh, was it fine? 
Fine's patent ran out. Same thing happened with the biscuit joiner. When Lamello's patent ran out, everyone rushed to the market and had a biscuit joiner. So it's, a, it's just a neat thing because you can do stuff like this, but you can also uh, do uh, door frames with it, for an example. I could biscuit this together. It's going to be strong. It's not going to be quite as strong because I, I can't put as many biscuits along that edge. Uh, so it's, it's just a fun thing to do if you can avoid running it into your finger. So if I'm a little gun shy here, that's what's going on. Uh, my depth setting is right on the side. So initially, I do want this set on 20 millimeters. Uh, because what I'm doing is I'm cutting a little bit more into the uh, front and back than I am into the sides because if I cut all the way through the sides then I do that and I don't want that so So now I have these guys cut, and for this I'll, I'll actually glue these in place. If I have a, a, a bigger uh, domino or a loose tenon that I'm putting in here, I need to actually put quite a bit of glue in. For these small ones it's just a little uh, dab, so what I do is I just run a little good, bit of glue along one face of the mortise run more glue around the back face and after a few uses you have a pretty good gut feeling for how much is enough glue and how much is too much glue. Uh, really what I want to do is drive these home and not have glue just spill out all over the place on me. So that's putting that part of the joint together. Now when it comes time to cut the other side, I have to stand that up. Double check my markings. Stand this guy up. Okay, this is what I missed the last time. Set it so the bit doesn't go through the wood. And so very quickly, I can knock out a, a drawer together. Maybe. Now I'll probably never get it apart to actually glue it together, but that's how fast you can put that together. And so this is something I, um, I really like doing because of course a lot of the stuff I'm building is prototype stuff where you, you just, you, you don't know what size it is so you can very quickly put that uh, together. Um, talking about uh, sizing stuff. This is also nice because remember the first drawers I showed you, it's like, okay, how in the world do I fit this to the opening? I need to measure the opening, subtract an eighth of an inch, get the front sized, subtract for the sides. What if I have some joinery? Do I add a half an inch back? Do I take a half inch away? Do I, or is it an inch? Or what do I do? With this, I can pretty much just measure the opening. 
subtract, okay, let's say I have an opening of 12 inches and I need an eighth inch to the sides, or let's not even make it an eighth inch. Let's say with this stuff, I probably feel like I should do 3 16 of an inch. So I can subtract 3 16 of an inch and then go down my tape and say, okay, subtract the sides. I'm at a little over 10 and a quarter. Mark my front and back for 10 and a quarter, cut them, put them together, done. And there you, you don't have to think about adding or subtracting for any joints. It's just cut this. If I can cut this straight and square, it's going to go together. I can put a drawer together and it'll actually fit in the opening. Uh, this is also really nice. It's something I like to do when I have to start dealing with uh, drawer guides. So when you're doing... I forgot to measure to, to double check. I'm not saying this wrong because I, I can never remember. And it is. Uh, side mounted guides typically are a half an inch on either side, so you have to subtract an inch from the opening. And that's assuming that the front of your opening is the same as the back of your opening. Hopefully it is. So it's um, for this style, if I, if I had that, so let's say I have 12 inches, I'd say, okay, I have 12 inches. I need to subtract the thickness of this, the thickness of this, come up with my uh, drawer front. That stuff is nice. What is nasty is when you get into the undermount drawer slides, um, which look like this thing. And this is what I have on this workbench. So let's see if I can get this drawer to come out. So this is the drawer for this workbench. And that is what the mount looks like. You have these little clips that go to the front. And you notice on the bottom, this is actually cut away so the slide can operate into that opening. So on this, that stays put, this moves, but then from the side, when this pulls out, you don't see the slide at all. The fun with this guy is all the instructions are in metric. So what they'll tell you is take the size of the opening and subtract nine millimeters. And you go, thanks for nothing. Uh, how, how am I supposed to do that? So what I typically do when I get into to stuff like this where I have to subtract uh, goofy numbers is I'll just uh, lay out my, my rule and say, okay, let's say I have a drawer that is 25 inches. Now I need to subtract nine millimeters. So what I got is, is just a little six inch rule where on one side it's in inches and on the other side it's in millimeters. Put this up to my 26 and say, okay, 26 minus nine in American is 25 and a strong five ace. And then from that 25 and five ace, I can subtract my drawer sides and then know what to cut this and to cut this to. So um, that's, that's my first recommendation on, on this stuff. If you run into stuff where it, it's all metric, stick with what you know. Just find a way to convert that very quickly without having to go, okay, how many millimeters is in a centimeter and how many centimeters is an inch? And I'm going to convert that over and um, get it there. It's just take the numbers off your piece. Don't worry about converting anything and, and end up with that number. So these drawers are actually... Um, dominoed together as well. It's five eighths inch stock instead of half inch stock. And uh, of course, if I was going to go back and do this tongue and dado stuff, I would have to go, okay, my sides are this, but then I need to add a quarter inch back or so to add to this. And then you might end up with a drawer that doesn't always uh, end up to what it actually should be. Um, it's the same with, with these guys over here. Sometimes you'll get slides that are uh, a little bit off, so you, you just have to um, double check before you get into it. Of course, I think it's easier to build a drawer that's a little oversized because if it is, I can actually shave a little bit off the side. I don't try to run it through the planer, but um, I'll aggressively sand it or you can hand plane it as well. If it comes out with a side mounted slide and your, your uh, opening is too narrow, you can always add a, a shim to either this or inside the case to, to bring that out as well. Uh, we had the question yesterday, where in the world do I mount a side mounted slide? And uh, 
I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It's, it's what you feel comfortable doing. You'll see a lot of people mount a side mount right along the bottom. And I think they do that because it's the least obtrusive. Uh, on a bigger, taller drawer, I get a little nervous when it's just all the way down on the side because you have a lot dancing around on the top. So uh, I'll typically move it up to a center line. And I think in a lot of instances, a center line is almost easier to deal with than to mount it on the bottom and then try to figure out that offset. I can mount a center line here and I can do a center line on my case and then uh, mount the slide right to that point. Probably the slickest tip I've ever seen for, for mounting slides, if I have a box without any dividers, so I just have a solid wall coming down. Let's say this is my, my box and I need to install little drawers in it. So I just have solid walls coming all the way down and I need to mount these slides. I need to get them square and I need to get them even. Um, one trick that I saw was you get a piece of plywood, you rest your slide on it, you screw the side to the wall. Move this over, screw this it to this wall. Take this up and then cut off what you don't need. Put it in, mount the next one down. Move it over, mount the next one down. It beats cutting up 12 pieces of wood, one for each side of all different lengths, and then you can just systematically work your way down. And the nice thing with a lot of these things is they're all, um, they're, they all have adjustment in it. So if you got them a little bit off, you can move the, Loosen the screws, move the slots a little bit, get them in there and go. So I, I would say the biggest thing with slides is don't worry about m mounting the slides. They're, they're pretty uh, easy to do. I mean, you look at how many holes are in this thing. And you can add more if you want to, right? So you have a lot of adjustability in this. Uh, the, the big thing I would say is building your drawer as precisely as possible to actually mount this through and <laughs> actually uh, read the instructions. I know it hurts, but you have to do it occasionally. So um, that's drawer slides in a nutshell. I do also want to talk about solid wood bottoms versus uh, plywood bottoms. I typically do a lot of solid wood bottoms because wood grows on trees and plywood does not. So I don't like to pay for anything unless I have to. Um, these uh, are, this is a built up bottom and I actually did it with this little tongue and groove plane. So I had some leftover softwood, and uh, you can kind of see the joint lines of, of uh, where these are joined up. So they're tongue and grooved, and then all of these boards are, are glued together. It's tight to the front. Uh, there's a little bit of a rabbit. You might see it more along what your, would be your left side. There's a rabbit, so it actually goes in a quarter inch groove. And then there's a space at the bottom. So I know this bottom is going to, sh in this dimension, it's going to shrink and swell this way. It's glued to the front so it can't go anywhere. It has to go out the back. So this would expand towards the back and contract back towards the front. That allows my movement. No glue in the sides. It's just free floating in the bottom. And then I have, uh, I haven't mounted this drawer yet because I don't have enough time. Um, this is something I've, I kind of worked up to uh, fix a large drawer where the bottom might sag. And this isn't anything new. This is a classic uh, old cabinet maker's trick. You have a drawer that's just, it's just an, a normal drawer. Um, this is dominoed together as well. It's got a groove all the way around. But then I have two bottoms in it and a center rail that uh, supports the bottom from sagging on me. If I did uh, a plywood bottom on this, it would sag like you wouldn't believe. That's probably one of the reasons I, I gravitate towards a, a solid wood bottom anyway, besides that it doesn't cost me anything. So this actually, you, you can see, it's, um, this stock is about three-eighths of an inch thick. The, the bottom is, I think it wasn't quite three-quarters, it was maybe five-eighths. So I put most of the meat on the bottom to help support these drawers, and then it has a tongue on either end, and that tongue fits into the groove that's going all the way around. So I had the front, glued this uh, into that tongue, and then I start sliding the, the bottoms in, then uh, glue on the, the sides and the back. These free float as well. 
So on this side, if I flip it this way, you can kind of see the groove along the bottom of that as well. This will allow that to, to move out the back. And hopefully it, it won't uh, sag on me. Now, the, the box I did first, which would be, I think I have the remnants of it here, actually has a, a slide in bottom that's not trapped in the back. So this bottom is uh, free floating. It's going to be loose in the back. Um, to keep this from sagging in the back, I might have to put a screw here. Or because it's a plywood bottom, I could also glue when I put this back piece or the back of the drawer down, I could actually put a bead of glue there, glue that in and, and clamp across that face to keep it from moving. With a solid bottom, I'd want to have it free so it could float all the way around in there. Maybe again put a screw there, but have it in a elongated slot so it could move around on me. Uh, probably the classic, classic drawer joint that all woodworkers look for is the dovetail. And uh, dovetails on drawers are a horrible, horrible thing, but they're so much fun to do. Um, we recently did a Tansu. Have you seen that cover with the stair-stepping looking thing? Uh, it's if after class it's right out in our gallery so if you go out this door and halfway down the hall it's sitting there almost all of it is there it's just missing one drawer and where did I put that drawer okay so Kevin's designing this thing uh, and I know it's not going to be fun to make because he wants me to build it uh, and he goes well I want to do dovetail drawers I said, okay, um, you know, how, how do we go about this in a way to, to make it look good but actually have it be able to be achievable because, what is it, it's a, at least five, six drawers and um, they're not very deep. So in talking about like anti-tip on drawers, the first drawers I did, you notice how I moved the back up on it? That's kind of my anti-tip. I have a solid side so you can pull it out to that point and it doesn't fall out of the opening. With these guys, we, we moved it all the way to the, the corners. So it, it comes all, the front goes all the way to the front and the back goes all the way to the back. This is typically something I'll do if I do a, a drawer uh, slide or a, a guide where um, I'm not worried about pulling the drawer all the way out and it falling out. This cabinet's only like 14 and a half inches deep, so he had to move the front and the back all the way to the edges, uh, just so you'd ha be able to put something in this drawer. This style drawer I'd say more is for when you want to use it, you pull the whole drawer out, and then when you're done you put the whole drawer back in. So we did dovetails on this guy, but we machined them all. And we actually cut these at the table saw. Typically what you'll see is if you want to do dovetails, people will say, well, you can only do it with hand tools, so let me sell you a $1,000 kit of hand tools and you can make one corner and then, you know, go do something else for a while. Uh, so what we did was we actually uh, figured out how to cut the, um, the pins with a table saw and we did the tails with a band saw. So the pins on this are on the front and on the back. Uh, so the pins are the little part that you can see end grain right there. The tails are going to be on the side, and those are, uh, tails are a little more uh, evident because they're, they're shaped like a, a bird tail. So uh, this is a, uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. It still took a while to machine all these out. If I did it again, I wouldn't put dovetails on the back. You put dovetails on the front so when you pull the front out, the, the rest of the drawer comes with it, and you can see it. You're never going to see that, but um, it's, uh, it, I guess it's one of those little things where uh, I know it's there, but no one else will ever know it's there. So I'll pass this around. The other thing I wanted to show you on this, when you look at the bottom, there's a little rabbit right there, and that's for the reveal. Because when you think about this drawer sitting in the opening, you have a sixteenth of an inch there and a sixteenth of an inch there and a sixteenth of an inch there, but it's flush on the bottom. So you cut that little bit of a rabbit in the bottom, and it provides that reveal all the way around. I didn't cut it all the way through. It's just uh, about a, a halfway through that, that piece. The, the rabbit? 
I just did it on the table saw. I got the whole drawer done, and as I'm fitting it, I just cut that, went right through on the table saw. Um, typically, when I put drawers together, I, I try to be as, ex as precise as I can in all the construction of it, cutting up the pieces, measuring it, getting it together, try to get the box together as square as I can, then put it in the opening and make any little adjustments that I need to do. Uh, one thing I do want to warn you about, uh, I had a drawer, this will be my example drawer, is, uh, okay, I'm gluing a drawer together. So on this drawer, I'd actually have to put clamps both ways because the corners are rabbited. So I'd need clamps to hold the sides to the fronts, but then I'd also need clamps this way to hold them tight to those rabbits. So I'm putting the drawer together, I measure corner to corner, uh, my measurement's off. So then I go, okay, well, I'm going to bring this together, so I'm going to put a clamp across these corners and pull it together. You can get into trouble when you do that on, on anything because what usually happens when you have all this joinery and you have a bottom in is you don't pull it into square. What you do is you pull those two corners high. So you end up with a drawer that's tippy. So I'll just stick this in. So let's say I pulled those corners up. What I did was I just made it do this. I didn't pull it into square. I, I, what I did was I pulled those corners high, and now the drawer isn't sitting flat in its opening. So um, it doesn't have to be perfectly square all the time to go into an opening. It can go in at an angle as long as it ends up with, with the face uh, doing whatever you want to do. But that's one thing I always check as well is get this on a flat surface and make sure this thing doesn't tip all over the place because that can cause a lot of problems when just for fitting let alone in the lifetime of a drawer if you do have a high corner what i'm typically doing is taking a, a block plane shaving off the two high spots getting it back and saying okay how are we doing making any more adjustments and, and getting it down once i get it flat on the bottom then i start checking it in the opening um, do I need to shave anything off the sides to do it? This is another uh, fast way to do a, a drawer. Instead of butt joints, we've done rabbits on the corners. And then after the, the glue is dried, we've gone through and pinned the corners with um, just wooden dowels. These are maple dowels on a, a pine drawer. The bottom on this is trapped, so we did a Baltic birch bottom. You could do the same thing also with the domino if you think about it. If, if you can glue this together carefully, you could come in with this and just plunge all the way through the side. So instead of these dots, you'd see that sticking through the side as well. So um, that's a, a quick and fast way to do it too. So let's, uh, oh, I need this. You want to do dovetails. This is my press. So we, we want to do a half line dovetail on the table saw. This is what we'll end up with. So this would be a sample drawer front with the dovetails cut into it. To achieve this, you know I can't stop the, the saw at a perfect 90 degree angle. So what we do is we actually resaw off the face. And I have a, a board in the clamps that's been resawn off. So here's the face for that. This started out just as a board. Took it to the bandsaw, resawed the face off. What's the first thing you notice about that? It is not flat at all. If you want to try this technique, what I would um, encourage you to do is resaw it off, get this done as fast as you can, and get this glued back on. Don't come back in two months because this is going to be, th this is messed up. <laughs> so. Um, I think I can get away with it. When I glue this, I like to use my parallel jaw wooden clamps, and you can kind of see the, the marks across it. I don't have to put calls on this to try to dis distribute the pressure of, of the clamp. I just put it in there, and there's clamping pressure almost all the way across here. So this was resawn on the bandsaw as well. I don't try to clean that up. If your bandsaw wobbles a little bit as you do it, it actually works to your benefit because when you put it back together, it's a mirror image and it locks. So uh, that helps you, once you get glue on there, if it's really uh, smooth, it can really shake up on you. 
And this is an old trick too. Um, this is this is an old cabinet maker's trick where what they'd actually do, uh, it doesn't matter if it's power tools or hand tools, it's faster to cut through dovetails like this than it is to try to cut something where it's all together because you can't saw it at all. You can saw a little bit and it ends up being a lot of chisel work. Uh, with this method, uh, another thing that you saw guys would do is they'd use, let's say I'm making it out of walnut, I'd use a plain Jane walnut board here, and then maybe this board would be burl or uh, crotch figure walnut, glue that on the front, and then you go, well, how in the world did you cut dovetails on a piece of burl? It's just the, the actual veneer on the front. So we have this part, this I cut yesterday, and I actually have this marked out. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just roughly mark out my pin locations. All I did was I put a square on it, mark those lines. So on this guy, what I pretty much want to do is leave these four little pins, and I want to remove the material in between them. And I'll do that with the dado set at, at the table saw. So we don't need this. Now the one thing I forgot was my tall fence. Has anyone seen a piece of wood with two holes in it? Here, little fence. How about we start a new fence? This is my uh, zero clearance fence for miters. So I have this big, beautiful miter gauge that um, is great for making 90 degree cuts. It's great for miters too, but for a lot of the goofy stuff I do, I just use a, a little miter gauge. This is an inc INCRA. Yeah, so I'm saying that right. Incra 120. Someone, if someone told me yesterday they were on Amazon buying one already, but uh, this is one I use for for a lot of miters and just kind of general purpose stuff at the table saw. I like it because it does it has a lot of adjustability, but it doesn't have too much where you're worrying about am I on it by a tenth of a degree? It's I'm either on zero or I'm not on zero, and uh, it's also easy with these slots to attach different things to it. So for this. I want to put on a, a little taller fence, so I have zero clearance back here, but I also have something to hold on to. So I'm going to put that about right there and then just screw this into place. Okay, uh, so for these guys, Actually, if I had it set up like this and I was cutting straight across, I'd be cutting box joints. Uh, I want to tip this 10 degrees. So for the first cut I'm going to make, I'm going to tip it 10 degrees uh, to my left, and then the next cut I'm going to tip it 10 degrees to the right just to cut that uh, angled shape of the dovetails. So when you're doing this, uh, after you've done it for a little while, it isn't bad to do it by hand where you're just holding it with your fingers, moving it over the board. You don't really don't get into trouble. What I'll try not to do usually is cut through and then pull it back. It's when I pull it back and it hits these teeth going against me that stuff wants to move. So typically I'll move it across, pick it up, bring it back. Not so worried about the miter gauge because that's trapped in the, the table slot. If you don't feel comfortable about it and you're just getting started with this, one thing you can do is, is obviously just put a clamp across here, clamp it to the fence, then you can put your hands wherever you want, move it across. The only negative thing then is it, it does take a little bit longer because once you get over here, you either pick up the whole thing or you release the clamp, get this, move it, you have a spinning blade. Um, so uh, again, sometimes overdoing this can get you into trouble because you have so much going on that um, you um, forget that the table saw is actually turned on. So I'm just gonna do it like this, do it quick. Uh, to set the blade height, I am gonna use, are these my, 
this is my side. So to set the blade height on this, again, I use the side. That tells me how high up I need to go into the front, the front to create that joint. Right there. Okay. Oh, also I have zero clearance. So I know if I put this line on the left side there, that's where the blade's going to contact it. Same with this other side. When I'm cutting there, I can put the line right on that point where the blade has relieved a slot in the, my, uh, my insert. And so that's how I'm lining it up. Now that I have that machine away and I have both sides done, I would uh, actually return this to uh, the clamps. Get some glue on here. Really make sure that I get uh, a nice amount of glue on these pins before I glue the front on. Make sure, yep, just like that. So that would go in the clamps. All right. Now with the magic of TV, we're already done. And uh, now we have to cut the, the actual um, tails that go in the sideboards. One thing I should point out, too, uh, when we were developing these dovetails, we, uh, Kevin just did, okay, I'm going dovetails, usually my groove for my bottom is a quarter, in, quarter inch up from the bottom. Uh, a lot of times I run that a little bit higher than that. I figure that the, the more meat you get between the bottom and the, and the actual bottom, the stronger that is. So if I did my groove an eighth inch from the bottom, unless I really glued the whole thing in there, it's probably just going to flake away. So he originally drew it in at a quarter inch on the bottom. If I did that on this, I would actually plow into that bottom pin. So in the plans, we actually had to move the groove up to 3 eighths of an inch. So that's something you have to think about too. Typically on this, I would do all the machining on this, get it together, and then figure out where that groove is so it doesn't 
go through the, the joinery. The groove can go through the pin, or the, it can go through the tail because that goes in and, and you're never going to see it. To transfer this line now, uh, what I would typically do is use a marking gauge to mark a baseline. So this is a wheel marking gauge. And to set this, what I'm going to do is set the fence against the inside face of the board, run the wheel up to the bottom of the joint, and lock that in place. Then once I have that measurement, I can scribe it across the, f the faces of this board and the ends as well. So what I'm doing is I'm just pulling this to scribe a line, scribe along, along the end. That has to be cut away. Scribe a line here. And the best thing is, if you have these scribe lines on, everyone will think you did it by hand. Even Ikea has that one figured out. But um, If you are having a hard time seeing those scribe lines, uh, a trick I also use is uh, fill in the line with lead. So I get a pretty hard lead pencil. This is a 5H. Uh, get it sharpened down to a nice point. Put it down in that line and just lightly pull across. So what I'm basically doing is using that as a guide just to uh, kind of color it in with a, a little bit of lead so I can actually see what's going on. Run it there. Run it there as well. Now I can transfer uh, this. So what I, I tr typically do, the reason I want to have that line is I want to bring uh, the face of this board right onto that line, tight to the bottom. I, at this point, don't care what's going on with the top. Hold that down. And then just trace or scribe the locations of those dovetails. This one's going to be a little bit of a problem child. If those lines are a little bit, let's call them drunk, uh, go back with a, a rule or a straight edge and figure out where it's supposed to be based on what looks the most straight. Go back through and get a nice line struck on that. Uh, now when it comes time to cutting this, it uh, is can be done by hand, but uh, another fast way to do it is at the bandsaw. So I have these lines. I'm just going to freehand cut them at the bandsaw. So I'm going to cut here, cut here. Then to remove the bottom, I could make a series of cut and cuts and kind of wally that out. Another way to do it would be just to chisel it out as well. Uh, the one thing we found is when you go to the bandsaw, we just resawed the faces off, right? So you have an aggressive blade in there. When you start cutting this little stuff, don't do it with a resaw blade because it goes like this. And uh, you have a, a little hard problem. So at that point, most board workers would go buy a second bandsaw rather than change the blade in the one that <laughs> they actually put together. I do the same thing. It's like, nope, 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 not, not changing the blade, not going to do it. Uh, but so we have that. So on these guys, kind of the cool thing is you're using a machine to, um, to cut what look like hand cut dovetails because you could obviously go through and measure this out, but you could have a little variability in the spacing as well. So when you get done, it, it looks hand done, uh, but you've taken a lot of the, the labor out of it. Um, I typically don't do too much with a, a dovetail jig or a dovetail machine because they're all different. Uh, I'm still mar I marvel at the people who can use like the lead jig where they actually don't have to read the manual for two days before trying to do something on it. And uh, you know I'm not, not a big fan of the fis fixed spaced ones because with those you're stuck to fixed. You know it's like well. I can only make my drawers five and five, five eighths of an inch, so now I have to redesign my whole cabinet. With this, it's just you walk up and you say, what size drawer do I need? Cut that drawer face, cut the joints to where I want them, and then um, scribe the side to fit, and it'll go right together. So that's how we did those guys on the, on the tan Sioux. Um, oh boy, we're running out of time.
Oh, like that? Oh, to, to cut those? So, um, on these guys, if I could go back and cut it at the table saw. So I've been cutting these at 10 degrees. I'm pretty confident I could do that. Uh, if I tip the blade to 10 degrees, the only negative thing is the way this thing is angled, I don't get into the corner. Does that make sense? So when I get my blade, I'll extend this line. Okay. So when my blade comes, I never get into these far corners. I would have to do that as handwork. But I, you certainly could do that. You actually find some production people, they will grind a custom blade at this 10 degree or whatever, whatever degree angle they're using it, have a right blade and a left blade. And so they can cut right up into the corner, right up into the corner, and then they either nibble this out or maybe chisel it out. The other negative thing on, on the table saw is if your spacing here isn't wide enough, you can't get the blade in there. So if you make these pins really, really small, uh, like you look at some of these, where the head of the pin is almost narrower than your table saw blade, you can get into problems there as well. And besides, my table saw has a dado head set in it. I'm not changing that out for anybody. <laughs> so it's, it, what I want to stress is do what works for you. What I actually found was they wouldn't let me go buy a new bandsaw, so it was faster for me to cut these by hand. So I got out my little dovetail saw, put them in the vise, cut that out. Not a, not a big deal at all for me. Um, it was actually one of the more enjoyable parts of the process. But, uh, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say with all this, take what, what you think would work and uh, apply that to your own situation and run with it. Um, kitchen drawer. You just make one of these drawers and put it in a kitchen. Uh, uh, and uh, going back to, to, you know, putting it together, obviously a, a lot of times in a kitchen you are using a, a drawer guide. So uh, you can get away, uh, I, I mean, a little bit with uh, wood selection. I, again, I see a lot of maple going into kitchen drawers these days. I, I think it's just part of the clean look. Um, and uh, the, the one thing I would do with a kitchen drawer is I would design it so it didn't have a wooden bottom. I'd, I'd glue in a plywood bottom on the thing, get the whole thing glued together as tight as I could. Uh, you don't have to worry about tipping because with a, a drawer guide, you could put the front to the front and the back to the back. And then um, what I would worry about the most with a, like a kitchen drawer or a bathroom drawer is getting a good finish on it that's going to be water resistant, whether it's oil-based poly or, or you're using like a pre-catalyzed lacquer. Just getting that thing so moisture isn't going to um, hit it and, and do weird things to it. Um, and we did talk about dovetails, so I'd, I'd call the dovetail the classic. Uh, and you, you, you look at a lot of old pieces of furniture, um, people did some crazy, crazy things. But, um, you know, the dovetail is what at least we look for, isn't it? We <laughs> the worst customers ever at a furniture store because you pull out all the drawers, you crawl underneath it, and you go, oh, yeah, I see where you cheated. And, uh, you know, normal people don't do that. They're just looking at how it looks from the outside. So any questions at this point? Good. Okay.